All right, welcome to this um, this talk. Um, this talk of uh, the power of Linux. Um, this talk will be done by Sandro. He has done many of these talks, and uh, he's also a very long time Linux user and a, a master student of computer science. And uh, and I'm sure he will show you all about the, the coolest feature of Linux, and and all that. <laughs> so uh, let me not waste your time. And please grab a feedback sheet and fill it out. It would be a great favor to us. All right, thanks. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, let's just let this pass. OK, so um, I got a story for this course is not about. Um, this course is not going to show you how to use your Linux in any possible way. And also, um, we do not expect you to be able to type every command with what I say. Um, because simply, we're going to have a very large window that we can look out uh, today. So this course is actually about all the cool things you can do in Linux that you can show in two hours. Um, we did this in the way that we went online and we went to ask some people on, uh, I think it was Reddit, the platform, and also some other platforms, uh, what's the coolest thing about Linux? Uh, we also introduced our own ideas to that. And we had like two or three pages of ideas. And finally, we merged them together into this uh, very course. So it's not, not really a course, but more like an outline of uh, what you can have. And we're going to start very simple so that every single one of you will understand what's going on. And we're going to go on a bit more. So even if you don't understand fully how to do things, that doesn't matter. It's just to get an idea of what is possible with Linux. And again, it's just a really tiny subset of the possibilities that you have. So I hope you're going to enjoy the show, and maybe you're going to get inspired to do some of those projects on your own. All right, um, so one of the main goals of this course is that you don't stop using Linux, because we're going to show specifically the things that Linux is particularly good at. Um, we're going to compare, not so much, but maybe we're going to compare also to other OSs. Um, and you can win. You can you can bet that they will not win the fight against Linux. What I'm going to present here. So we really want you to stick to Linux to have a reason for using it. Because if you just use your daily life, I mean, you have your existing routines and your existing systems, um, which is not exactly our goal. We want to help you change yourself for something that you might like better. And these are all incentives to dive into uh, occasions where you can learn more um, if you attempt them. And eventually, it might actually change your life, uh, your digital life, just like it did mine about three years ago. Um, all right, so you want to get to love your new system, I hope. And today, we're going to make a step towards that, hopefully. Let me turn this on. It may work better. There we go. OK, basic stuff, stuff that you can already do. One of them is automatic update and shutdown. So basically, imagine I have a system and it has 200 updates, which can happen easily on any system if you haven't updated it for a while. Uh, you don't want to have that system building the updates all the time, waiting for it to complete, and then eventually you have to check if it's done and then turn off your computer. You just want to say, OK, I type one command, and once this command completes, the computer turns off. So that is very, very simple. First of all, we type sudo su. This is something you have probably seen many of us do at the install event. That means become permanently the administrator. Who remembers that from the course yesterday? Wow, nice. OK. So for those who didn't remember, that's what it's about. Um, then, now we're administrator. You see there is a hashtag. This is an open source system, by the way, um, but it doesn't matter. So the hashtag means we are the super user. And so now we can use the package manager of OpenSUSE. We say refresh to check for updates. And then we say update with no, uh, no interactive mode. That means do not ask for permission, do not ask um, if it's OK to do something unless something is going really wrong. So it's just doing whatever it thinks is best. For example, the question, do you want to install these updates? It will just answer itself with yes and keep on going. So it's completely unattended. And then the last command is power off, which means shut down the computer. Um, there's also a command shutdown. Uh, shutdown helps you scheduling a shutdown for your computer. For example, when I copy a file and I want to go to bat, uh, it's still not done. I can say sudo shutdown uh, dash h for, um, 
for uh, halt, which means power off, and then the exact time I want. For example, 0300, which means 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, this power off command is equivalent to shutdown dash H now. Uh, it's just much smaller to say power the computer off now. And you will notice one more thing in here. This is the and and signs. Um, these ampersands are uh, they mean that once the first command has completed successfully, execute the next one, and so on by transitivity. Um, if one command fails and indicates that by its an error code, um, it will just stop there. So usually, like say well-programmed uh, programs, they will cancel this pipeline, and I expect it to stop. If, for example, we have no internet connection, it will not power off the computer. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Um, it's unattended, so it's potentially dangerous. It just replies, yes. If you have this very one packet on your system that you should never upgrade for some reason, maybe because you want that particular version and you want to keep it, it will just reply yes and it will install it and you have to, down to downgrade it again later. So it doesn't ask you, you do not check, you are responsible anyway if something goes wrong. You just trust the computer. And 99.9% .9 .9 of the cases, this works just very well. So I use it a lot. Some people say you shouldn't. Um, the reason is that you don't know if something goes wrong. But you will find out in the next boot, right? So you will know how to fix that later on. OK, so I'm looking at the feedback yesterday. You gave a lot of feedback. That was cool. Thank you. You said you wanted more package manager because you didn't understand the package manager. There was at least 20 people stating that. So um, let's have a short recap on the package manager. Um, here we have Ubuntu, uh, including Linux Mint, uh, also Debian, it should work that way. Um, there's OpenSUSE, um, and for Fedora users, you will just look it up online, I hope. There's just so much space on the slide. So this should get 95% of you covered. As always, we are there if you have any questions. So the package manager under Ubuntu is called apt or apt-get. That's not exactly correct. There is also dpkg and aptitude. Um, basically, what you have to type to install your updates usually is apt on a newer Ubuntu system. But they are not. I, I don't think they're very uh, straightforward with a package manager. They have so many of them, and they, some of them work somehow together. Um, basically, what you need to take away is that usually you will need apt. And you should be able to complete all the commands here with apt. So this means sudo apt update, apt search, sudo apt upgrade, sudo apt install. And then usually you should be able to do sudo apt auto remove, but on some systems apt cannot do auto remove. The feature has not been added, and you have to do apt get. Uh, apt get is the older version of apt. You can have all these commands with apt get except for search. That's why I'm presenting you apt. Also, apt shows a program, progress bar. So if you have been totally confused, here are the, the, here's the one thing you have to remember. On Ubuntu, use sudo apt, and then whatever stays there. On an open source system, the thing is much more easy. Um, it's zipper. It's always zipper. Uh, that's the command you have to type. Sudo, zipper, whatever comes. So how to check for updates, how to look if there are any updates available. What is the newest software on the internet? It's sudo apt get update or sudo zip refresh. To search for software that you have on your system to check what is the name of the package, does it exist, you go search in both of the packet managers. To install updates, to put your system, your local system, to a newer state and adjust it to whatever is available on new software on the internet. On Ubuntu, you type upgrade. On OpenSUSE, you type update. Okay. And to install software, it's install straightforward. To uninstall software on OpenSUSE, you say remove. On Ubuntu, you say auto remove. The difference between auto remove and remove is that auto remove will also get rid of programs that you don't need anymore as an addition to the program you just uninstalled. So yesterday we had this uh, this LibreOffice example. Um, in this example, when you uninstall all the LibreOffice programs except for base, and you have never declared that you want to install base explicitly, the package manager will assume that you also want to remove base because you don't need it anymore, because there is no more program depending on it. And it will ask you for confirmation, unless you specify the non-interactive option, of course, and then remove that package as well. So it just takes off everything you don't need. That's why auto-remove comes in very, very handy. Any questions about this? 
All right. Anybody need a live demo? It's not very spectacular. One person. Yes. <laughs> is there something similar in OpenSUSE? This is OpenSUSE. Yeah, but like the auto remove. There is, I think, remove on OpenSUSE does the auto remove. Um, any anybody having a different opinion? All right. Looks looks like the the key is valid. I'm um, tried out. Um, I think it should it should be uh, this guy. But I'm not an OpenSUSE user. OK, so let's do something cool. Let's create an ad hoc network. It's basically a network where you can, where your, your laptop basically turns into a router. I don't know, have you ever been with a few, with a lot of friends, nerd friends, on a train? A train ran lasts about two hours, and you're like, oh, if we had a router now, we could just play this game on network. That would be so cool, but we have no internet. Right, so you either take out your cell phone, your cell phone overheats and dies because there's too much traffic or it just doesn't work. Or you take out your Windows laptop and you'll find, oh no, the feature has been removed a few years ago. You have to type something in the console and it's really complicated. So here is Network Manager. Most of you already have Network Manager installed. Let me give you a live demo. Um, I think this one should be free. Uh, down here, you have wireless. Right, so if I right click it, I can edit my connections. And there, I can actually, um, I think with a left click on my system, it depends, it depends what kind of click you have to do uh, on the system you're using. Um, but you can say create a new wireless network here. And pretty much all of you should somewhere have this option. And then you can say, either if you have already done it, it will show up the ones you have already created. Um, you enter the network name you want, my free network, and then whatever security you want. Um, I don't have uh, many packets installed. Most of you have more packages here, so you can create a secure uh, WPA2 network. And then you enter a key that you want to have. Everybody else enters that key, and it will just connect. Note that this does not work with Android smartphones. They do not lock like, the kind of technology that uh, you have when you do that. I don't know why. And that's how easy it is. Once you click create, it will create your wireless network. Um, you will not have internet, of course, unless your computer is actually connected to a LAN port uh, with some actual internet thing. If you have a Wi-Fi dongle, you can forward the internet connection from one dongle to the other. Uh, it actually works. Any questions? OK. So um, another thing, this is just a really cool demo about what you can do with your system. We, we praised you in the first introduction to Linux course that you can replace anything that you like. So, start menus. There are so many more available that you will think. And you can also install multiple start menus at once. Just use a package manager, install it, and use it. Um, you can use start, uh, start menus from desktop environment, which are not the ones that you're using. Sometimes it works. And then there are start menus which are independent, such as uh, copper or D menu. Um, you can have clipboards. I'm going to show you why you might want to have a different clipboard than what you have. We're going to show you file managers, different ones. That's like the Windows Explorer or the Finder thing. Uh, also, of course, you can have as many shells on your system as you want. So far, you have probably been using Bash. Um, I'm a Fish user sometimes. Sometimes I use Bash. I have both on my system. I just switch widely between them like I want. And you can do that without any problem. OK, so let's look at start menus first. This is the XFCE default start menu, AKA Windows XP style and super crappy. I hate it. Um, this has been cool 10 years ago. Nowadays, you want to have this, which is a start menu that you can search for. You don't have to go through all these uh, menus in order to access your stuff. You can just search and press enter and it will start up like any sensible start menu you have been, probably been using in the past five years. Um, this one is probably now default on your system. If you don't have it, install the Whisker menu, and you will be able to use it. This is specifically for XFCE users. Um, Copper is for everybody. Um, basically, what it does is it's small, and then when you type, it will open up a lot of stuff. You see there is a ton of plugins. Also, you can have many themes installed, um, and it can do lots of things. Uh, such as look, searching your files, searching your mail, etc. Um, it's kind of like the, the Windows start menu, which tries to be as polyvalent as possible, or also the, uh, the Mac search. But here you really define exactly what the start menu has access to. All right, um, 
Then there's D menu. That's what I'm using. I like D menu because it's small. So basically, what does that mean? Check out in the very, very top of the projection. Do you see it? That is my start menu. For those who don't see it, it's there. So once I start to type, let's say Firefox, OK, and I press Enter, and then it starts up Firefox. So it's extraordinarily fast, and it does pretty much nothing except for starting programs, which is exactly what I need. I don't need any fancy start menu. Maybe that might be not enough for you. Maybe you might, might want to have more. But wait, D menu has plugins. So this is still D menu. It looks a bit bigger. Um, and it actually searches uh, the online directory Leo for the search term that you have. So it goes and browses, and it looks like crap, but it's extremely powerful. And this is really something you should get used to. Just because it looks stupid, that doesn't mean that it's stupid. And just because it looks fancy, it doesn't mean it can do many things. So always check it out before you judge. All right, um, clipboards. You have two clipboards on Linux. The one is the one you know, Command C, Command V, Control C, Control V, whatever you prefer. Um, on the console, very important, Control Shift C, because you know, you remember what Control C does in a console? What does it do, anybody? Stops process. Um, also, what, um, what was not said, what I think is cool too, when I type something and it's really long, and I don't want to re-raise it all, press Control-C, it gets deleted. That's cool too. Um, but see, when you copy something, you don't want to use Control-C in a console. It's Control-Shift-V, uh, C and Control-Shift-V. However, in other processes, then of course, you use the normal Control-C, Control-V. Another thing is that once you double-click something in Linux, it's already copied to a different clipboard. So, again, here the console example. For example, when I want to welcome to fish, I select it, double click or select, it's the same thing. And then when I want to paste it, I middle click. So on my laptop, that can be hard. Um, it was interesting on an HP laptop with this special touchpad that you have the buttons on top and the buttons on the bottom. When you press the buttons on the bottom at the same time, it will do middle click, uh, which is uh, Synaptics, the driver on Linux that uses your touchpad. So I just press my finger on the middle of the keys, and there it gets pasted. And this is completely independent from Control C, Control V. So you can have two things at the clipboard at the same time and paste whatever you want. For example, you can use something bigger that you want to paste later on to have in the main keyboard, the clipboard, and then you select something. It also works in LibreOffice. Select something, it gets uh, copied, and you paste it somewhere else, and then you can paste the bigger thing uh, with Control V. Now, to paste with a physical mouse, um, you can actually press down the scroll wheel in a straight way. It will click, and this is the middle click. So, two keyboards, I mean, that's all right, but that's not enough. Let's have multiple uh, keyboard entries. So, there's Glipper. It's called the Clipboard Manager. Um, basically, what it does is it remembers the, well, here it's set to 10, but you set it to whatever value you want. Uh, last things you have copied, and you will see that you can just click whatever you want, or there's a keystroke, whatever you prefer, and then that becomes the main entrance. And you can set it up for the middle click keyboard, uh, clipboard or for the Control c Control v clipboard, or both of them. Now, of course, you can also copy images, right? And this is just text only. So if you want an even more powerful clipboard, this is what I use. It's called Copy Q. And you see that it has a, a, a small menu here, just like uh, Glipper, which we saw on the other slide. But this time, you can also display pictures. And even more, um, if you click the symbol instead of right-clicking it, again, this depends on your window manager, it pops up a screen. And there you will see that even HTML formatted web pages uh, get copied. Pretty powerful tool. Um, of course, this can all be um, put in with uh, keyboard strokes. And you can manipulate the, the clipboard. You can execute commands. Uh, there's a huge plugin set. Lots of lots of things you can do. Even tabs with, uh, yeah. Let me not get too lost in this topic because it's big. Try it out. It's cool. OK, let's talk about file managers. Um, this is Nemo. Uh, if you want to find it, you can go to the package manager and just install it from there. Um, the thing is, Nemo comes also with a desktop. Now, I don't have a desktop on my system because I think this is like the number one reason to mess up your system with files that you put somewhere and never look at again, and then you have a huge mess of files. That's what's the desktop to me, and I don't want to have that. 
I want to force myself to put every single file in a logical way, not just throw it on the desktop. That's why I don't have one. So um, there is a command. You can say Nemo disable desktop uh, on Google, and it will tell you a command to type, which will disable the desktop of this one. Else it will overlap with your actual desktop that you have. But if you turn it off, you can use Nemo with any desktop environment that you want. Cinnamon users, you already have Nemo as default file manager. Um, it's cool because it has all the, pretty much all the advantages of good old Nautilus um, for those who like it. Um, also, you still have the possibility to split the screen, which was something Nautilus lost when the update to GNOME 3 came. So just press F3 and you have two windows open. That's very handy if you want to fast a split window with uh, another folder. Um, you can have, of course, your favorites, um, there is network support, uh, etc. Now, another important thing about Linux, um, there is no network protocol support in Nemo by default. Um, it does not, it's not able to read a specific protocol. However, what it does, it is able to communicate with a program that can then uh, talk to the actual network protocol, such as SMB, the Windows network protocol. If you don't have SMB installed, Nemo will not be able to open up Windows locations. Um, most of you already have SMB installed, it's called Samba. And that means that Nemo will, once this packet is detected, automatically be extended with the function. There's just one little, let's say, plug in Nemo that will then become enabled. Uh, that is why Nemo can be so slim, because it doesn't have to implement these things itself, but it relies on other software, which are then optional dependencies for Nemo. All right? This is like a super central thing about Linux. Anything can use anything else. And this way you, sp you save a lot of space. Okay, here is Space FM, which is another one. I find it ugly, but um, the cool thing is it tiles. So, you know, I told you Nemo can have two different uh, folders open at the same time. Well, SpaceFM can do much more than that. Um, also, you might like to have a console-only uh, file manager, which is Ranger. This one is pretty cool because it hijacks your frame buffer in order to display pictures in the console. Console being a text-only environment, this one hacks itself into the console to display images. So my friend uh, has been using it for a while. Are you still using it? Yeah. Yes, she is. And it's been, I think, about two years now. Whatever you prefer, whatever floats your boat. There are many more. KD uses you have Dolphin. GNOME uses you have Nautilus. OK, now let's talk about shells uh, before we conclude this demo. Um, Bash is what you probably know. Bash can also look like this. So there is a happy cat. And once you have something that goes wrong, it's a sad cat, and it becomes happy again. Um, if you want to do that, if that uh, makes your day, do it. Um, also, see you have uh, very interesting commands like Fortune, which just displays a random fortune cookie, and Cowsay, which is a cow that says whatever you give it to it. And so if you plug this command into that command with this pipe, it will just forward the, uh, the content of fortune to Cowsay, and the cow will say your fortune cookie. This is default on Linux Mint, and Cowsay is used to display a penguin. Uh, if you ever have a need to do that, you can do it. You can personalize bash using a file, it's called bashrc. Um, it starts with a dot, so it's a hidden file, and it sits right on your home folder, and that is where you can have all the configs for your bash. Um, you have already seen these yesterday, so I will not uh, go into detail there. Uh, I like to use Fish because it's for lazy people, for people who don't want to learn how to bash. Because out of the box, it has a lot of interesting features. Um, to show a few, if you type something that makes no sense, it shows up in red. If you forget apostrophes or ticks or anything, uh, it will show up in red. Um, it will show you auto completions while you type in gray, and you can press the key to write, and it will auto-complete it with that. Um, it has a history that you can search in both ways with more intuitive commands than Control r namely the keys up and down. Um, also, you can have a browser for configuring it. Uh, <laughs> if you have ever wanted to look uh, in real time what a theme looks like, uh, you can configure it in the browser. So it's, it's more intuitive uh, to get started uh, with themes. Etc. Pretty cool feature set. Try that. sudo apt-get install or sudo apt-install fish, sudo zipper-install fish, 
do the Pac-Man install fish, whatever. I think you got it. Set shell. This is the ultimate shell. Many people say um, has a lot of features, extremely lot of features. So here we have GitHub uh, or Git integration. It shows that you're on branch master. Uh, it can do much, much more than that. Uh, I think you can even check your email and show at the console uh, a line that you have a new email. Um, I don't think there is anything that Setshell cannot do. I think it can even cook your breakfast. I don't know. Um, and then we can talk briefly about Tmux. Now, Tmux is not a shell, but it's a container for shells, basically. So what Tmux does is you open it first, and then inside Tmux you have a shell with fish, bash, Setshell, whatever you like. And in this, you do things, and suddenly your connection crashes. So let's say you are working on a remote server, your connection gets stuck or your local computer crashes. Now there's still a shell somewhere on that server that is alive, but you cannot access it anymore because you just got kicked out. All you want to do is you want to attach again to that shell. And with Tmux you can do it. If you started it in Tmux, you can say Tmux A and it will connect you to that very shell again. Uh, and it will even show you the output. Also, um, what I just discovered yesterday, because uh, Simon was doing it on the projection, and the things he typed, he didn't really type on the screen on the projector, but he typed it in a different console. Um, let me try this out myself. I've never done it. Let's see, Tmux, there we are. And I say Tmux attach. And then I try to type something. Oh, this is magic. So if you want to ever collaborate with your friends, you can do that. Okay, enough about this stuff. Just one more thing. If you want to be really nerdy, you can have, of course, configs that you can style Tmux to look whatever like you want. So this is a Gentoo user. It's a Gentoo logo made in ASCII art. Um, I think he has, yeah, there's music waves of what's currently playing, and this is actually his playlist. Um, yeah, if you want to spend time with that, you can. I, I, do, I do a lot. It's just You don't see it that much on my computer, but I will show you an example later on. Um, you can play a lot if you want. All right, so let's talk now something about something more serious. Um, before, that might not have helped you. This is important. Let's redirect output. You have to know that every time you have a command, it shows text, right? Like, for example, setting up whatever program you want, or uh, installing and then a board that has a progress bar, uh, or error messages. This is output. There's two kinds of output. One is the good output. That's like uh, completed successfully, or uh, progress 20%. And then there's bad output. This is error, could not locate file, error, uh, no permissions, etc. The good output is called the first output, and the bad output is the second one. So when you want to redirect the good output, you can, for example, um, do you know the echo command? Okay, let me demonstrate you echo. It's not that hard. Echo hello world, and you will see it says hello world. Okay, so basically what it just does is it echoes whatever you put in afterwards as arguments. And so what you can do is you can redirect the uh, echo output, which is exactly what you gave it, to some other file. Basically what this means is echo created on, and then we're going to look at that afterwards, and this is redirected to a file called masscopy.log, which means that it will create a file which is called masscopy.log. It will overwrite, watch it, overwrite everything that is in this file. It will be empty immediately, and it will write Create it on, and then it comes a date. Now, this is something special in Bash. When you have this dollar sign and you open the parenthesis, what you write in the parenthesis as a command will be run, and the output of that will then be substituted. Uh, the, the output will then substitute this command. So, um, let me start up Bash and show that to you. Okay, let me let me make. I think I have a bigger console. Can you read this a bit better? Okay. So let's say. Echo hello, and we can say date. Uh, date. All right, everything clear so far? All right, I can say echo, hello on, and we go dollar date, which is what is run there. And that's what it does, okay? My system talks German, so it looks really stupid, but that's what it does. All right, and if we redirect this to redirect, 
you will see that when you look at, you remember cat? Okay, it's on there now. Note that there was no output given by this part, even though here we had output. We did the exact same thing, now we have no output. Why do we have no output? Anybody knows? Yes? That's right, the output got redirected. And now it's in a file and not on the console anymore. That's how output works. Okay, so we saw that it will, if, if I had a file redirect in my home folder and uh, I would have executed this command, it would have erased everything on this file, which is not what I want. Maybe. So if I don't want that, I have this. This means append. So I just, instead of having one of these, I put two of them. Uh, that means let, that, that everything that is in the file and at the end of that, add more output. Very simple. Um, so this is the good output. But if we write uh, rm a file that does not exist and we redirect that, um, you will figure out that the error message still gets displayed on your console and it will not be redirected. So what you want to do to redirect error messages is you do the same thing than there, but this time you write a 2 in front of it. This means second output. And again, to append to a file, to not delete what, is, what was there for, before, you just add another one of the larger than signs. So for example, this means copy everything in my home folder to a folder media target, and then if there is an error, append that to masscopy.log. And you will see that those two commands combined make a lot of sense, because this one creates the mass copy, writes the date on it, so that you will see what date that happened because maybe you run it multiple times and just one time it fails. And then that will make that this file contains, in, uh, additionally to the date, it will not remove it, um, all the errors of this command. And we'll sum them up, and so you can have it unattended, just let it copy, and then you can check. If the file is empty except for that, everything went well, and all the output that you don't need is just discarded. Only error output gets there. Um, if you want... Uh, both. Let's see. No, I don't have it. Um, if you want both of them, um, there is a, a very special syntax uh, for redirecting both of them, or you can just uh, combine uh, both of them. So you say larger than, and then you say too larger than. Um, and then the pipe operator. Remember cow safe on fortune? So we take whatever fortune gives us and we put it into cow say, right? This is not the same thing as output redirection, because output redirection relates to a file. Now here, this is special. We give whatever comes from the left, and we put it into the right side. And this does not mean that we put it into the toilet. This means word count. So let me demonstrate to you. LS, you remember that. It's all the things that are on your computer. All right? It's just shows whatever is in your current directory as files. And wc is word count. So basically this means that what I have just entered is three words, two lines, and 12 signs. So what happens when I say ls and I pipe that word count? And it is. Are you asleep? Should we do some yoga? Who knows? Who knows what happens when I do that? Nobody. Yeah, one. That's right. Um, so let me look a bit more in depth into that. You have to write final answer. Um, it will count all the lines, all the words, and all the letters that I have in my output. The output is one single file item, of, let's say file or directory, per line. So when we count the lines, we see that one line is one file, so we count the files. And that is what he said, it will count the files, and that's what it does. So I have 73 files in my home folder. That is why, generally, you don't use how many files are there in this folder command. You can have it with ls, but if you're just interested in that, you can use that. Um, here's another thing. Um, find dot means show me everything that is in the current folder and all subfolders. Um, 
just for, uh, for completeness, maybe folder and directory, I say it's the same thing. Technically, it might not be the case. Um, let's say some people say it can be a different thing, to be very correct. To you, I think it's enough to say it's the same thing. So find all the directories uh, and files that we have in the current folder and all subfolders, and then search for the term hello. And this will filter the output of that and will only show me the lines that contain hello. So there was a lot of output uh, in other ways to do it. If you just have find dot in your home folder, and there will be much less output after you have filtered that, believe me. You can try it on your own. There's a question. Uh, right. Yes, let me, let me repeat that for the camera, thank you. Um, it's, he said that find actually has a way to, to search for a specific name by itself. That's why it's called find, of course. Um, the thing is that the syntax is so horrible that many people don't even try to remember it because you have this, right? This is the lazy way to do it. Just pipe to grab. Um, if you use Linux for half a year, this kind of thing will feel so natural to you that you will not even learn how find works and then the, it, the day that this is not enough you will google it up I, do, I still don't know how by heart find you know you don't have to be an expert in everything um it works very well by just being lazy okay um let's talk about dd dd stands for the uh, it's like a blockwise copy program many people say uh it stands for disk destroy um, they call me the great chairman for this reason. Do you, do you want an anecdote? Yes, okay. So, um, myself being sometimes a bit confused, um, people told me that one day I will mistype uh, what, whatever arguments I give to DD command. Because what DD does is it takes a source device, file, command, whatever, and it puts it bit by bit, without any abstractions, without any interpretation, exactly the ones and the zeros, like it reads them, puts it on the target. Target, again, being a file, being a, a device, or being a, a command. And so, what we do is we use this to have as an input file uh, on the left-hand side, we put uh, a file, which is an ISO file, for example, ubuntu.iso, which is basically a CD image that you can burn to disk. You know CDs, yeah? These round things there you can plug in your computer? Actually, check this out. I have a CD drive on my laptop. Amazing, isn't it? It's just three kilos. Okay. Anyway, um, it's old. So, DD will put this bit by bit CD copy onto a USB drive. And guess what happens? The USB drive will become the actual CD. And when you plug it in your computer, your computer if it's able to read that, we'll just boot from a virtual CD. But actually, this data is not stored on these disks, but it's stored on a USB drive. Isn't that great? Yes, not spectacular to you, because every single one of you have done it in the install event. But this is how we created them. DD, lots of DD, about 300 of DD every semester. So you type sudo dd if equals whatever your Ubuntu, whatever CD is called, of equals slash def slash sdb, which is a first USB key on your computer. Then you repeat it, same thing with def sdc, e, f, g, i, j, k, it went up to z, a um, on a machine because we had lots of USB hubs. And so you repeat that and repeat it and repeat it and then once you have all completed you start again with B and suddenly you find out that before it ended up in J, it started, it ended up in I. And I is like before J and still there was all USB keys blinking. So what was going on? And then one of the processes completed after about 10 seconds and it showed me 300 megabytes per second throughput. It's like super fast. It's like as fast as an SSD is. Now guess what my SSD is? It's SDA. And guess who lost all his data? Ooh. So that's why they call me the great chairman, because um, my friend came in and he told, der große Vorsitzende hat SDA geflasht, and you like that. So anyway, um, just destroy him. So I think you got what the program does. Um, by the way, he, Dino, can you wave a bit? Yes, that's the guy, he just wrote an uh, anti-DGV, uh, anti-der große Vorsitzende script, which will refuse to flash SDA if you type SDA, and it works. 
So um, as a short recap, IF for input file, OF for output file to specify. And this could really be anything. Um, if you specify BS, that does not mean what you mean. It means something different. Um, block size, actually, it means. You can set it to 4 megabytes, and this will make it go faster, because the chunks of data that will be co copied at once will be greater, and this way um, buffers will be used in a more optimal way, depending on the system. But you can always specify it. And then modern systems also have status equals progress. Uh, status, sorry. And if you do that, it will show you the current progress, which is a brand new feature. I don't know how many years DD has been around, and you never knew how, how far it went unless you sent it a, a process interrupt, uh, which is totally not intuitive to do. You have to, to say kill DD and then specify a flag to send the way to kill DD, and instead of dying, it would just output the progress it made. So finally, with this option, problem is solved. Um, so this is, uh, again, an example. Def sr0 is my CD drive. So if I had a Ubuntu CD, um, I would just do this, and it would make me an ISO file out of that. And if I replace, if I put the, this ISO then on the left-hand side and the USB key on the right-hand side, uh, it will put this data to the USB key. Um, all right, and again, this this drive. Okay. There is another example. This is how we did the keys. You should get it by now. Um, also, what's interesting is you can use pipes with DD. So what this does is it reads as the A1, which means the first partition of my first drive, which will be my boot partition, and it will zip it. Now, you may use zip normally, because this is what creates a zip file, which we probably use uh, on Windows or Mac. Now, I decided to use pbzip2 instead, and that has a particular reason. Namely, pbzip2 can use the same stream of data, one big stream, and use any cores that you have on your processor to compress it at the same time in parallel. This is super cool, because you can read USB keys in real time and compress them as you go. So this, the bottleneck is still the USB key. If you have a sufficiently powerful machine, it goes extremely fast. Your machine gets quite hot with that, but it's, um, it's nice. So you can compress things without losing any time in real time. Enough of that. Let's go do something that you might use in practice. Um, DD you, you will use maybe in half a year or one year later on. Um, this is something you can use today. How to VPN to uh, ETH. So on an OpenSUSE system, you go sudo zipper in. Remember what that is? Who does not remember? Everybody remembers. Very nice. Network Manager Open Connect is the name of the program. Note that Network Manager, for some reason, has capital letters in it, and it's case sensitive. Um, don't know why they did that, but the package is really called this way, and you have to type it exactly like that. Tab completion will help you. Um, the other thing is on Ubuntu, you do sudo apt install. You have to add this GTK if you use a GNOME system. Otherwise, the applet will not be installed. So now, in order to connect to ETH, once we have installed this, Again, we go to Network Manager, we say Manage Connections, we add a connection, and now Network Manager, just like Nemo, it has a lot of blocks that you can plug your software in, and this Network Manager Open Connect GTK is exactly what you need to get, where is it, this, uh, that is it. So that is uh, the protocol that ETH uses for VPN, and we say we want to do that, we create it, and what you have to type here is the name, let's say ETH Linux says demo. And the only thing you need to specify here, all the rest you don't need to change, um, the gateway is sslvpn.ethz.ch. And you can say save, and suddenly you get down there, VPN connections, and you see there's the Linux says demo. Um, if you click it, it will ask you if you want to connect. Well, let's try it. So it says, it has already connected to that host. Now you can enter your credentials. I hope my password is right. You can save your password if you want. You can say login. No, it was wrong. I don't know why they started having two different passwords. I never know which one goes where. Okay, and that's it. And it unconnected. And I'm at a VPN. So no need for this annoying Cisco client, which you really don't like which I don't like. You might not like it either, I know. Um, if you go to VPN connections again, you can press it again and it will uncheck. Some of you will have on older systems uh, 
a button for uh, disconnecting. Okay, do you guys need a break? Who needs a break? Be honest, last semester I got feedback that people could not concentrate because they had no break. One person? All right, would it be okay for you if we keep on going? <laughs> Else we take a five minute break if it's necessary. Okay. So my, my threshold is usually three people. Okay, YouTube DL. Um, this is something cool. YouTube DL, you say, this is the command, YouTube DL with a capital F, dash capital F. And um, I, think, I think Simon said tag yesterday. I say dash, it's the same thing. Um, and then you put into ticks the URL of the YouTube page that you are currently hyping. So once you've done that, it will show you different formats. And once you go a small f format, which is the number of the format that you chose with the URL, such as the 141 with the URL, you will actually get to, uh, to download the file. So let me show that to you. Mm, let's, let's just copy this link. I have no clue what it is, but I must have, I must have known at some point in time. Uh, let's again take a bigger console. YouTube DL, capital F, control shift V, and paste it in. This is just a totally regular YouTube uh, web page. And you see there are the different formats. So there is uh, audio only here, different formats, like the 140, 171 is audio. Um, and then we have videos in different sizes. So the best one has already been marked for us. And it's the 43. So let's take that one. Key, key up, arrow up, home, control right. So this is how you can do speed. Small f, 43, and enter. And there it goes. And it's, uh, this is what we're getting, apparently. Ganone de Spazi. Oh, this should be music. OK, so let's watch it. Mm -hmm. And we have music. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. OK, never mind. Um, why do we have a video if we have music? Isn't that stupid, right? So I would just want to have the audio because it's music. So I don't, I'm not interested in the, in the image. How do I do that? Any ideas? Yes? That's right. Which one did you pick? The highest resolution? Highest one. Uh, 171? Well, um, you can look at this. Um, this is like the bit rate. Um, this is smaller than that, so I would probably just try that. Also, the file size is a little bit higher, which usually means that we have better, uh, better quality. So that would be 140. Um, excuse me. Yes. Um, 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 I would say that the important part here is what the codec is. Uh, so the Vorbis codec and the Opus codec, especially these days, are seen as as the better codecs, and they are also royalty-free and open source. Yeah, that's right. Plus, Thank uh, you for that. But I'll just repeat for codec, camera. Uh, might have hardware acceleration on certain devices, just so you know. Yeah. Um, the thing is, uh, YouTube has different codes, uh, codecs, different formats, how it saves um, the, the videos and the audio. And what he just said is that Vorbis is a word that you might uh, want to like. Um, because it is also an open source, uh, open and free software uh, format. Open and, open and free format. I have said the other word too many times. Um, so we might want to prefer that. Um, of course, everything can be converted into anything else, but there will be losses. Um, so we can also pick 171, because last time I picked 140, it might be boring. So let's take the 171. And again, the thing starts up. And it has completed very fast. So I can play this. Sorry? It, is, oh, it has already been downloaded, right? Um, because I have not deleted the old file. Thank you. <laughs> it goes very fast when it doesn't download things, right? Um, the thing is, when, you're YouTube, when you use YouTube download in a train and you stop at SBB and you give it not a video page, but a channel page, 
it'll download all the videos from that channel. And that's just really cool. Let's say you like Futurama. There's lots of Futurama on YouTube. So you just stop at a stop. And every major stop will have Wi-Fi access points. So you connect to that. And you just press key up, enter. And it will keep downloading where it has stopped before. If a file has been half downloading after your train has started, you can just download it. And I proved that if you use a mid-sized format with the SBB Wi-Fi, you can stop, we can keep watching Futurama without ever having to download anything outside the train. It works. Um, anyway, if you have ever needed that in your life. So just to prove that it works, here is VLC, and we have music. Beautiful. So, enough. Let's go to MPV, which you have seen before. MPV is a, a question, yes? Oh, yeah. uh, no, I, I guess it's, very, it's worth mentioning that YouTube DL is not restricted to YouTube, so you can download something by no. me or... Right! Thank you, I completely forgot. I completely forgot to say that, right? Um, YouTube DL is not restricted to YouTube. It started out with YouTube, but it supports many more things. Uh, I think Vimeo might be part of it. Uh, I think I once even got it to download something from the Swiss National TV. Um, it's quite impressive. It, it auto detects formats and has lots of plugins um, that will help it to detect when there's a video, download the video. I think it works about 95% of the times I tried. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, all right. So um, MPV is like a, a better video player um, than what you probably use today, simply because you don't use the mouse to control it. I mean, you can use the mouse if you want to, but you might be much faster if you use keyboard strokes. So one of them is, for example, go a little bit forward would be the key to the right. Go a lot forward would be the key up. And you can scroll through your videos in absolutely no time. Imagine with a mouse on VLC, for example, you search in the bar, you click it, uh, it's a bit too much behind. You click, oh no, now I click two-way. But if you have your keyboard strokes, uh, it reacts just immediately. It goes da, 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 immediately. Uh, so it's really fast. Also, there are commands for full screen. Um, you have a key for audio video delay. So for example, if it's not synchronized, you can switch it on the fly without having to browse through menus. Um, you can also, of course, toggle subtitles, have a different language, etc. Everything, all the support that you know, with the difference that you choose to do it with a keyboard. Um, of course, you can do that in VLC too, but MPV forces you to do it with the keyboard, which makes it very nice. Um, for those who know MPlayer, uh, that's like the, um, the old version. Uh, nowadays, people use MPV and the keystrokes are almost the same. So I switched, and I re would recommend you to switch too. Um, it's a pleasant experience. So, what could this? Bit of, okay, it says it, it says the solution. Uh, I don't have to. I cannot do. Ask you. This means if you have YouTube DL installed, MPV will use YouTube DL to stream videos from online. So let's use this shortened YouTube URL and paste it into a terminal. So this means grab YouTube DL, give this URL to YouTube DL, and then stream that immediately. And it will start the download. And off it goes. And this is being streamed from the internet right now. So you see how fast it scrolls? This is from online. I can find extremely fast where I'm going. If I want it a bit faster, no problem. Let's say I want it slower. And there you see that in the background. Okay, let me stop that. You will not pay attention to me otherwise anymore. <laughs> it's a, uh, by the way, it's an open source uh, movie. If you, I think it's the only one that I know, but it's very famous and it's fun. Um, why do all the students like children's videos? Maybe it's not a children's video. I don't know. I just watched Finding Dory too, so you don't feel ashamed. So um, basically, it will, it will show you what went wrong, but still it will correct these failures automatically, uh, if possible, and hide them from you, so you will get a very pleasant movie experience. So if I had pressed the F key, it would have been full screen, and I could just have watched it on uh, cinema mode. Anyway, so now imagine you have movies on your laptop, and you want to stream them to a TV. Uh, basically, transform your laptop into an NAS network at that storage, right? Does anybody have some of those? Nobody. OK, most of you probably have a smart TV, and it has DNLA support. It's like this weird thing with the four letters you have never heard of. This is what it's used for. 
Basically, you start a software that is a DNLA server, and then your TV will look in the network, see your laptop, just as if it was a USB key played directly from your laptop, or Wi-Fi, um, if your Wi-Fi is fast enough, of course. So, Rigel is probably the easiest way to do that. I uh, don't know how it's pronounced, though. Um, this is what it looks like. You say what you want to share, where you want to share it, that's it. And it will automatically make a sensible folder structure that your TV can then browse. Uh, Mini DLNA is nicer if you have a small device, such as Raspberry Pi. I have that at my parents' place, for example. So their stereo system, uh, their hi-fi, and their TV will go to the Raspberry, which is attached to a hard drive. And so we have a 30-box server with an old hard drive that you can just plug in, DLNA, that's it. So easy. Uh, MediaTomp is another one um, in case any of those goes wrong. Um, also, Kodi has support for DLNA. Um, don't use Kodi, it's the worst software I've ever seen. <laughs> so I will not recommend it um, because it's just crashing all the time for me. Anyway, now let's talk about PDFs. Or do you, do you, how many people do you want to break now? <laughs> Threshold is still not still not there. Okay, let's keep going. Um, PDF is something you might use very much, and you probably don't want to edit PDFs because you have to buy the super expensive Adobe PDF suit, right? Um, so you don't need it. You have Linux, right? So you don't need any of those. Um, so what we have is two programs that we can play with. One of them is PDF Unite. Basically, what that means is you give it a lot of sources and a file where you want to put them, and it's going to go through them in order, and it's going to concatenate them. So if you have a page 1 and a page 2 to 5 and a page 6, you just do PDF Unite, you put them in a list, you say output.pdf, whatever you want, and immediately we'll create uh, a file that contains all these pages merged together, even if they have different sizes. Um, the cool thing is you can mix it up with blobs, that's like the cool star thing you, like, you learned yesterday. So we just say part star.pdf, and we put all these course parts in order, in alphanumerical order, and um, watch it. What, 10 goes before 1. You have to type zero, 01 in your file name. Well, I don't know if anybody knows a way to get around that in Bash. That would be great, because I hate it. But just, just make sure it starts with 0, 02 if you have more than 9. But then you will put them in order and put it into merged. And if you respect your naming conventions, I mean, this is just so fast. Uh, the other thing, the other way to do it is uh, PDF separate. That's the, the opposite. So you have a source and your destination. Now, you have multiple destinations. But instead of having to specify for every page in the source which destination name you want, you just say percent %d at the place that you want to have the number. So you can say PDF separate images.pdf, which is like, I don't know, five pages. You say image percent %d.pdf. So that will be image one, image two, etc. As many pages as they are. And those commands also take arguments. Have a look at them. You can limit the scope of where you want to start from, which pages do you want to extract, etc. And especially at ETH, where we have such reliable printer systems, sometimes instead of specifying the printing rate uh, on your print demand, you better just produce a new PDF because it will take you just as long as typing in those page numbers. Uh, in the submit form, and then submit the PDF, and you know that only that's going to be printed what you want. So you don't pay for 200 pages if you just want two of them. Any questions about this so far? All right. Let's go going with uh, PowerTop. You can do live demo. Um, I, th I hope my console is not too large for that. So you have to go sudo. And it's sampling, and uh, there we go. This is PowerTop. It will show you an overview of everything that is going on on your processor mainly, and this is how you get the power consumption of your laptop under control. So if you see really high values here, um, this might be the reason why your laptop is being slow or the battery is dying. So right now I'm recording my screen uh, So I, for the recording later on. Um, you see that this takes about the majority of the time my laptop is awake. Um, this is uh, how much of my processor is idle. I find, um, tap, by the way, to switch between uh, the different tabs here. I find this uh, a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, let's see, maybe it's device stats. No, it's the other one. 
shift tab to go back. So um, I see the different frequencies at which my processor can operate. The thing is a processor operating a specific frequency consumes a specific uh, amount of amperes or watts. Uh, and as a result of that, you want to have the frequency as low as possible. But a, uh, a low frequency is a slow processor. So you want to have the processor running slowly when there's nothing to do and fast when there's a lot to do, which is what pretty much any processor does by default. Here are the different frequencies. So you see that the processor is idle, which means sleeping, for about 88% of the time. And this is my first CPU, whereas the package, all of them are just idle 10%. I have uh, four CPUs, eight virtual CPUs on that machine, and um, it shows me exactly for every single CPU what is going on. Um, and you see, once these numbers here, the high numbers, get high values, you know your laptop is fairly busy. And you can also hear it on this machine, it goes Woo! Okay, so this is how you can see it. Um, also, if you have your cable, uh, your charging cable unplugged, uh, let me see. I think with R I can refresh. This is very interesting. Uh, I'm getting an interesting bug on my screen. There we go. Yep, there you see. Uh, my discharge charge rate is 34 watt. So it's a super mobile laptop, right? Okay, your laptop probably consumes about 5 watts. Um, this one is one hour and a half and the battery is dead. Your laptop probably has 8 hours. And the higher the value you see there, the more it consumes. Uh, the reason for this is that my laptop has <laughs> the actual dedicated graphics card, which you probably have turned off because it consumes too much. It is the only graphics card that is plugged in. I don't know why HP has done that, but um, this is the reason why it has such a very high um, discharge rate. And you see in one hour, 15 minutes, I'm already gone. But you can say tunables, and you see all these values are bad. That means that if I change them, I could get better battery. This is what PowerTop would recommend me. Have a look at it. Program is very complex. Can do lots of interesting things. And another thing is CPU power, um, which is uh, another program to do related tasks. OK. Now comes probably the part that people like best, according to the feedback. Photo rack. So once you have, you know what a file system is? Yes means hand up, hand down means no, okay. So just our experts know it. Okay, file system is where your computer keeps track of where what file is. What is a file? A file is just a series of ones and zeros, right? So let's say I have my big buck bunny super video with lots of ones and zeros. And this file has lots of information that we are interested in that is not part of the file, F such as the file name. It's not written in the file. It's an information about the file. It's called meta information about this file. Um, when, we, when was it last modified? Who does it belong to? Who has access to it? Uh, Etc. So, what we want to have is a file system that keeps track of the file. One very important thing of the file system is um, your hard drive actually consists of blocks that hold a certain amount of bits. And you want to keep track of what block does the file start at and how large is it. That's kind of important, right? So if you say, I want to play Big Buck Bunny, you're going to first ask your file system, hey, there is a directory, and it's called videos. And in this directory, there is a file Big Buck Bunny. Could you please tell me where I have to jump to to read that? And the file system says, OK, it's block 365,256,998. And so your system will jump to that, and it will start reading from that and feed it to your player. Um, if you haven't understood it, it's not very important. Um, if you have, even better. The thing is, what happens if the file system breaks? You have still all your files there, but you have lost all your file names. You have lost where the files start, etc. Basically, you don't know anything. You're like blind cow, right? So photo rack is what jumps in there. Oh, by the way, when you delete a file, when you physically delete a file, not trash bin, RM, what happens is the file will not be erased bit by bit. Because if you would delete a three gigabyte file, you would have to write three gigabytes of zeros, which would take a whole lot of time. On a slow USB key, it could take, I don't know, 20 minutes to delete a file. However, what happens in reality is it vanishes immediately. The reason is that simply we have deleted the reference in the file system to that file. And we have removed it, and that is why we have 
no more file, but it's, the content of the file is still there. Just the way to find it is gone. All right, so PhotoRec undoes that. PhotoRec recovers files that are deleted. It recovers files from broken file systems, but it will not know which directory they resided in. It will not know if the file was deleted or the file system broken at the time that you started it. Uh, it will not know anything about the file. It will just look for patterns, such as a video is always start with a specific pattern of ones and zeros. It will say it's a video, and then it will try to understand the video to find the end of the video. And it will put the file that it found with a correct extension of what it guesses it could be into a recap folder. That means when you use RM, you can undo RM with uh, PhotoRec, right? Who's not okay with that? Anybody contradict? You're not okay. Why are you not okay? That is correct. Maybe after some time the memory will be overwritten. So my disk is almost full. It will take regions that contain data from previously deleted files to put the new files on. I mean, it's okay because the file is deleted, right? So we might not, we might not be able to recover that anymore. There's another reason why it's a bad idea to say RM is okay. Any other ideas? Okay, the thing is, you don't get back your file name, you don't get back your folder. So if you put PhotoRec onto a disk that appears empty, and it has been the main system disk, you will get every single tiny icon file back. I don't know if you know how many icons there are on a normal system. The back button on your browser is an icon, right? It's a little arrow. You will get it back, every single thing, and there will be approximately between 30,000 and several millions of files that PhotoRec will recover. Find yours, okay? No, you don't want to do that. So that's why I have this little special friend for a live demo. This is an SD card. It's rather old. This is the SD card that came for free as a demo SD card with my very first camera. How large is it? What do you think? Take any guesses. 100 megabyte? No. 16 megabyte. So it's really small, so basically what we're going to do now is we're going to put PhotoRec on that and we're going to look if there is something on it. And it's going to be fast because it's only 16 megabytes uh, total device to recover. So sorry I have to take the smaller console because the bigger one uh, is too small. Uh, it doesn't make sense, right? The thing is, the smaller your font is, the more size it has. Uh, so PhotoRec needs a certain amount of space, and, and the bigger one, we don't have it. So, so, so uh, let's first do LSBLK. That means list all the block devices. And we see that we have here my famous SDA, which has suffered a bit in the last time. Um, I saw a zero, which uh, has nothing on it. And this MMC BLK0, that is my SD card. The first partition being that one that we see it has a stunning amount of 14.2 megabytes uh, after a file system has been abstracted away. So, sudo photo rec. You see this is fish, it tells me all the things I can do. MMC BLK0. Um, yeah, let's just imagine that my partition is even broken. Let's put it a whole device. So, welcome to PhotoRec. Um, it will tell me that it has no warranty. Okay. Um, by the way, PhotoRec recognizes about, I think, two or three hundred different formats. It can do a lot of things, even Word documents, PDFs, etc. It will detect them. Um, so, I want to say I want this whole disk, MLCBLK0. Yes, proceed. And there's a partition. It's FAT12. It recognizes that there might be partition on this disk. I want it. And then it will try to suggest me if I know the file system that we have. This is an SD card from a photo, so probably it's going to be FAT table. This all helps PhotoRec to detect my things. And I want to scan the whole thing, not just the free space on the disk, but the whole disk. Oh, by the way, just one thing in case you don't believe me. Uh, let's try to have a look at this very thing. Uh, okay, sorry, I cannot access to that while PhotoRec has exclusive access to it. Uh, that's why it's called exclusive. Um, I'll, sh I'll prove you afterwards that the thing is actually, it doesn't contain any files. It's all deleted, it's empty. So I say I want the whole. So now it asks me where do I want to save that thing. I'm going to go in downloads and I think, let me, let me create a new folder. MKDIR, downloads, PhotoRec. 
So let's go one up and then back to downloads and it should say PR. There we go. And then somewhere it should say oh, C when the destination is correct. And there it goes and it started and it has recovered 13 files. So if you have a two terabyte hard drive, this will take a while. This will take days. Um, whereas here, 13 files were recovered. Isn't that interesting on an empty file system? So I want to quit. Uh, and I'm going to quit again. So now let's look. Let's look at the SD card. Um, oh, there's, there are a few a few photos that we have there actually, from Christian. Oh, you know that guy. And the alt has a few design elements, etc. Uh, so it wasn't completely empty. Sorry, I lied. But if we now look at downloads and we look at PR, we'll find not only these pictures, but oh, oh, what's that? Okay, let's have a look at it. Because this, this I can guarantee you, it was not on the card. And this is actually something that really happened to me when I tried photo rec on this card. I did not know that these pictures exist. And there it says 2005, which is precisely when I got my first camera, right? So these are pictures that have been on that disc for 12 years. And they have been deleted at the camera afterwards, after they have gotten a larger SD card, 256 megabyte at a time. And I deleted them. And today, 12 years later, it will actually show these pictures. So that is how powerful PhotoRack is. All right? So let me tell you a few things about PhotoRack, which are rather important. Um, first thing is that we recover. Ah, sorry, that is for some other demos. OK. First thing is it will recover anything, really, literally anything. If your browser has trouble with filling your RAM, like you have not enough memory, or it just wants to speed up things. It might cache some pictures. So like the Google logo is, might be uh, an object that gets actually written down to the disk for faster performance. So when you, when you install the web page the next time, it will not download it from the internet. It will just ask the internet if that picture is still up to date. And if yes, it will immediately show it from your hard drive. That's called a cache, and it speeds up your browsing a lot. Thing is, if you watch interesting things, like very interesting things, like things with not many clothes on it, then you might have the fact that even those get cached. And the browser, when you then say clear browser history, it will just delete them off. Or if you close the browser, or if you are in safe mode, or whatsoever, it will just delete those. But remember what delete is? Huh? Just taking away the reference. So if you use PhotoRec on that disk, this stuff actually comes back. Even if you have not downloaded any porn in your life, if someone has watched it on your computer, there's a certain risk that on your hard drive it will come back. This is why you want to be very careful with PhotoRec. Uh, I have had several cases with people where I had to recover files, where I just gave the disk and said, just look at these, sort them out while you're alone. Because there's lots of very interesting data that comes back. Do not misuse that power, OK? All right. Oh, and there's DDRISQ, which is uh, worth another mention. Basically, if your hard drive is half broken, it has broken sectors on it, which means that some ones and zeros cannot be read. And if you use DD on that, it will fail. It will say IO error, and it will just die. That's why we have DDRISQ. What it does, if it cannot read, if it's a one or if it's a zero, um, it will write, I think it's a zero. By default, and it will tell you this is broken. So when you have a half broken hard drive, you can use DDRescue to copy all the data that it contains to a safe location, because half broken means if you do this, it's going to be all gone, maybe. Very vulnerable. Um, also, um, once you have it on a safe location, you have a backup of that. This is like the worst case scenario. And you, would, you will be able to save what is there left to save. Might get back at least some of your files before the hard drive finally dies. So once you have a hard drive that is almost dead, but you can still more or less read it, um, do DDRISQ first, and then you can still use PhotoRec uh, on that if, in case your file system broke, which would be very unfortunate. Still, do a backup. Always do a backup. No hard drive, no SSD, no USB key is safe enough for you. Always have data at two different locations, okay? For your own sake. Okay. Um, yeah, half an hour is left. XRender, um, in case you want to have, well, you have wondered what I have done, you remember I have 
done things on my laptop, suddenly I've turned off the projector, I've pressed one magic button and suddenly everything that I saw in there was the same. You might remember from Windows, you go Meta P, projector, and you say, I want to extend my screen, I want to have the internal screen, etc. I don't need that because I have a keystroke for everything. Keyboard shortcut, putting my laptop internal only, putting it on the, uh, on the screen only, uh, extend it to the left, extend it to the right, etc. And that script uses XRender. Um, XRender is the program that will use your, that will put your screens onto the places you want. It sets the resolution, it sets the rotation. For example, sometimes, um, if you've ever seen a guy with looking very stupid with a laptop that's turned like this, that will be me because I have a special shortcut where I can rotate the screen in a way that I can set my laptop like this. Imagine you have to read a call script, it's very handy, it just looks stupid, but it works. Anyway, XRender can rotate things as well. Um, also, you set the resolution, I might have said that already, uh, etc. So, my friend, for example, she has a script that turns off her laptop screen and turns on the TV screen uh, using a HDMI protocol called CEC, which you can talk to the devices actually. So it's like, hey, wake up. The CTV magically wakes up from standby. It's a bad script. And it will turn on the TV, put it on the right resolution, turn on, uh, output all the laptops, uh, volume, uh, sounds to the TV, and she has cinema mode. And it's one keystroke. Um, that is why you might want to master XRender. Um, you certainly have uh, GUI configurations where you can press buttons to have your screen resolution adjusted. It will call internally XRender. So this command might be interesting to you. Um, oh, there's the script I was talking about. Um, it will turn off both PC screens because she has two of them. Um, it will turn off the screensaver. Uh, it will set the TV as the main output and it will put it to the left uh, of this screen. I uh, don't know exactly why she does that. Um, but here is the CEC, which will turn off, turn on the, the TV. And then finally, she of course needs a random wallpaper on the TV screen, which is crucial. Okay. It anyway. really is. It really is. It's her, by the way. <laughs> um, there's another cool script. It's illegible, but just to show you the power, I don't understand it. I wrote it, but I just copy pasted things from the internet. Um, Basically, what it does, the thing is, the TV of my father is like really stupid, and when you open pictures on a USB key or on DNA, it only supports a very small subset of uh, picture formats. And so we have about 30,000 pictures, and we would like these pictures to work on a screen, of course, because we don't want dia projectors anymore. So much a hassle. Um, so what we do is, we check every one of those single 30,000 files, if it has the right format, and if not, we convert it. And how do we do that? Of course, not by hand. Uh, we do it in a bash script. So um, this actually finds all the files in current directory, and for every one of those, it looks if the file is a picture, and if the format is wrong, it will convert it into the right format and save it back. And it took about, I don't know, 20 minutes for it to go through the entire server, and now the TV displays all the pictures. Okay, I worked one hour to find out this script, which I had to really copy-paste from snippets. Um, still, one hour compared to 30,000 pictures, that's nothing, right? So it's worth it. Sometimes it's worth it. Okay, keyboard shortcuts, more keyboard shortcuts. Um, if, you have, if you use import, which is a program in the image magic package, you will be able to draw a rectangle and this will become your new screenshot. Um, it will save it to file automatically. Of course, import takes lots of arguments. You can say, I only want the current window, I only want the, I, I want the mouse, I don't want the mouse, etc. Um, check it out, it's fun. Image magic is very fun. I think this mockery file here is also part of image magic. A very, very powerful program. Uh, you can convert PDFs to pictures and vice versa, um, and much more. Then also, you can master all your music with a program called Clementine. Uh, let me maybe show that quickly to you. Of course, I have a keyboard shortcut to start it. And now it started in the background. I could play music like this with another, uh, with another keyboard shortcut, or I can make it put, uh, put it in the foreground. So you see it has very nice keyboard uh, support. It's just a music player, nothing spectacular. It's cool, it works well, I like it. Um, Another thing is MPD. MPD is a music player too. 
but unlike the music players you know, it's not running on your computer, but it's running in the background on some machine. So assume I have MPD on this laptop. I have to download, uh, MPD is a server. It runs in the background and you have no way to control it, uh, you might think. When you start MPD, it just says I'm started. And then what what you do? Thing is, you have MPC, the music player client, um, which is basically a program that connects to MPD over the internal network connection loopback in the laptop, and it will talk to it. And then there's another program which is called Aereo. Uh, I can attempt to show it to you, but I don't have MPD running here. This will fail. It has to fail. Mm -hmm. There we go, this is Aereo. It just looks like a player, but it's not a player. It's just a remote for players. So you can have a console uh, remote, you can have this remote. I have an app on my phone that's a remote. What for? Because my Raspberry Pi runs MPD. And it's connected to a stereo. So basically, when I, st when I start Aereo and I say play, the thing is it will not play it on my laptop, it will play it on my stereo, which is a completely different computer on the network. It, it even works over the internet, but uh, I disabled that, of course. Uh, it only works when I'm at home. That's why it was unable to connect. thing is, I can have that with keyboard shortcuts. Um, for example, when I do Control-Alt-Shift-P, which is totally sensible to me, you choose whatever you want, um, it will start MPC, like the little client, and it will tell the client to tell the server to start the lecture, and the server will play. And how long do you think that takes? Any ideas? When I press Control shift alt p until the music plays? Seconds? Minutes? Okay, well, uh, the thing is, it's instant. I do not feel a difference whether it's on my local machine or in the stereo. It just happens right away, even though so many different devices were involved. Super cool and extremely reliable. MPD is extremely reliable. Um, so um, the thing is, uh, when I have my, my stereo playing music and I use it with my computer, I tend to forget that I'm not on my computer. So I turn off my computer and there's still music playing, uh, which is not exactly what I want because I want to go to bed. And of course, I've turned off my cell phone because I want to go to bed and don't want it to disturb me. Suddenly, I have this Raspberry Pi thing, which is like a tiny box that sits on my ceiling that is playing music, and I want to stop that. So I wanted to have something physical, some buttons. So um, please note that I'm not an electrical engineer, um, nor I, am, I have absolutely no clue at how to solder things. So this is my first attempt, and it works, and I'm really proud of it. Please don't tell me how stupid it is, how bad it is. It's working. <laughs> I think there's like resistors missing all over the place. Anyway, this is an Arduino. Um, electrical engineers probably like it. Um, it's a device that will measure currents on these different pins. You can plug in physical things, like these buttons are from my childhood when I played around with them. And there's these LEDs with some resistors. I plug them, and when I press a button, the Raspberry, ah, the Arduino will note that. And there's a little C++ program running on it. Um, that I wrote that will send then this over the cable to my Raspberry Pi. On the Raspberry Pi, there is Ruby script, which is another programming language, it's like Python, but I like it better. And also, that will then start MPC locally on the Raspberry Pi, and it will tell MPD to do whatever. For example, here we have play pause, then we have louder, less loud, next, last, whatever. And the thing is, when I press that, the music will just stop instantly. So it feels like you're actually doing, you're just pressing pause. What's really happening is you have all this, these things. It's actually internal network command triggered by a lambda function that you will have pressing this button, even though it looks like crap. Um, and of course it will blink green. Now that's not enough. The problem is that at one point I figured out, you know, now I can turn on and off my music while I stand by this thing. But my stereo has to run either all the time, and it goes like bzzz, very, very, very not loud. So this is disturbing, especially when it's calm at night. Also, I have to get up. Imagine that. I have to get up from my chair. I have to walk over. It's like three meters, right? To my stereo, go down, bend, and press the button to turn it on. It was a 20 box stereo from the 90s. Uh, it works very well, but it has no command, uh, telecommand for starting it. So um, hijacking the infrared was not an option. What I did instead is I 
put in a little magic device called a relay into the main, uh, uh, the main uh, on-off button from this uh, stereo. And there is this cable here. When this cable has, I think it's five volts, the relay will turn on and it will hijack the on button and it will sh short circuit it and the stereo will turn on. Now, MPD will write its output to uh, ALSA, which is uh, the muse, uh, uh, sound server on Linux. And ALSA has a file which you can read out and the file will either say closed if there's no sound coming out or it will say whoever is bringing in sound to that. So my Ruby script, which is interpreting commands issued from this one, will do one more thing than just waiting. It will actually also every second check if the stream that comes out from ALSA contains the word, the word MPD. And if so, it will make sure the stereo is on. And if it says closed for more than two minutes, it will turn the stereo off. How does it do that? It communicates back with this Arduino because the, uh, turning on the LAD is the same thing as turning on the stereo system. So basically, if we put all that together, I sit in my chair, I press Control Alt Shift P, stereo goes on, and there's music. Um, I had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yes, you can do it with uh, with other things, but I mean, this whole thing cost me twenty bucks, um, and I learned a lot of it. Uh, yeah, this just as an example. If you want to go nerdy, you can do whatever you want. I'm, I'm working on a 2.0 touchscreen version of this now. Oh my god! <laughs> Another useful thing that you could have is light. Um, it will have your, it will steer your laptop brightness. Um, thing is, it takes. You, you probably know. Let me let me demonstrate that to you. You can press a button. This is absolutely spectacular. Watch out! And it gets less luminous and it gets more luminous than the other button, okay? So this is what you know, this is what sucks, because when you go to 100 to zero, you press it 10 times. This sucks. So why not take a program like light and give it absolute values, such as I want to have, okay, everything is turned around. I think this is the button, the minimal brightness or the maximum brightness or something in between. This is the brightness that I want to have in my room when it's dark. This is the brightness when it's night and dark. And this is the brightness I want to have when there's sun. So these are presets, these are specific values in percentages that I could enter, and of course I have a, a very simple key shortcut for that. So that is why you might want to think outside the box and not just use your buttons the way they are, but try to understand what programs are actually working in the background to adjust your screen brightness. Because suddenly you have this comfort of having uh, predefined levels of what you want. Same thing with PA mix with the volume, depending on what uh, earplugs I put in, I want to listen at a different volume. Of course, I have a key for every one of them, and with a single keystroke, uh, I will just do that. Okay, let's go a bit faster through that. Process management. Um, when you have this yes command, no, yes is a bad example. Um, is there, I think there's a sleep command, right? Right, sleep three, sleeps for three seconds. So, I'm going to have sleep 20, it will sleep for 20 seconds. I can put it in the background with Control Z. Now it's in the background. I can put it in the foreground with FG, and there it keeps coming back, okay? So Control Z does two things. It pauses the process, and will not make any more progress, and also it puts it in the background. And then you have like a stack of processes, and it will, they will get numbers. So this sleep command, oh, it has already completed, but my console has not shown the enter sign. So. Um, this is something, if, if you think that a process should have completed, try hitting enter, it might just not show that it is completed. Um, the thing is, you see here one, um, if I control Z multiple processes, um, I can have, I can say some of the, for some of them what I should do. For example, when I say sleep 10, control Z, sleep 10, control Z, I can say BG, uh, BG2, and you see that the process number two, which is that sleep command, has been put into background. This just means that the output still goes to the console, the process is run, it's not paused, but I still can type things here. And the end sign just means that run, it's run in the background. So difference, for example, here would be when I go, I go Firefox like that, you see that the console is busy, right? I don't get a prompt until I exit Firefox and then it's done. The other thing, oh, and, there, and it also says that my sleep command in the background has completed, of course. Um, the other thing is when I say Firefox background, 
you see that now it has spawned a new process in the background and I can type here while I am using Firefox. That's foreground, background. And with Control Z, BG, we can put things in the background. With Edgy, you could put them in the foreground again. So I still have a sleep command in the background, right? I think it's like jobs is the command, right? Right, you see that Firefox has been there, it is done. And I still have the sleep 10, which is stopped. When I say FG, something interesting is going to happen. Um, namely, the command exits immediately. The reason is that sleep wakes up and it sees that the time has already elapsed these 10 seconds and it will stop immediately. Okay? Otherwise, I would just get the command that I uh, put background first. Um, another thing is kill uh, or kill all. Um, let's put another example. Yes, woohoo. Woohoo. So let's see. Um, I can use top to see all the processes. It's ugly, so I use htop for human top, which is another program which you can install. It's like a task manager for the console. And I can search for yes. And the console is really small there. You see the command is yes, woohoo. So I can now say kill all yes woohoo. And it will kill the woohoo, the yes woohoo command. Um, why kill all? Because if you have multiple yes woohoo running, it will kill them all. If you have multiple chromium running and you type kill all chromium, it will kill all the chromiums. If you don't want that, you have to look for the PID. You say kill PID. And if it doesn't want to die, the program can refuse to die. You say kill all dash nine. This is like the shotgun. So that means and it's gone. And then the process will not be able to refuse. It will just die. Unless it's a zombie. It really is called that way. A process um, that has no more mother is called uh, a process that has terminated, but it has nobody who wants to adopt its uh, remainings, which is this fertig thing that you saw. It's called a zombie. And to kill a zombie, you have to kill its mother. Um, this is absolute correct terminology. Um, <laughs> I did make it up, but if I could have, I would have. Um, SSH is like super cool. Um, let's skip the live demo, it takes a lot of time and people didn't like it last time. Um, SSH basically means log into a different computer and store the console there. Let's say I have the IP address of my computer, 123.5.4.6.789, uh, 00, I don't know. Then I can say SSH, my username at this IP address, one, two, three, et cetera, and it will log into that. For example, computer science students. Who's computer science student? All right, you have Optimus machines. Um, so if you go, you have to be in the ETH network or VPN, of course, which is the same thing, essentially. Say SSH, your ETH username at optimus.ethz.ch. This, you get immediately a console on a server uh, that is running at ETH. Um, this is cool when you want to talk to Raspberry Pi such as this. See, I want to connect with the port 1513 to my IP address of the Raspberry Pi. And there I am. So when I say htop here, you will see there are only four processes. This is the Raspberry Pi. This is actually the thing that is running on my ceiling. And I see there it's doing very well. Uh, it's running fine. And there's a few processes running on it. So I'm quite happy with that. Uh, I can also say install updates, etc. The thing is, my Raspberry Pi doesn't have a keyboard or mouse attached to it because there's SSH. So I don't care where I am. I can type uh, start a beamer, turn off the beamer, etc. Um, I can look for MPD to check if there's music playing. I can start it, stop it. It's like I have a console on my system, just on a remote system. Um, the other thing is, if you want to uh, send a file to your Raspberry Pi, you use SCP, it's like CP and SSH combined. Um, you say CP is copy. You know what copy is? Okay, yeah. So we have here the input file that you want. This is a local file, as you see. It also works the other way around. Then I have the SSH port, which specifies user and machine. I say do two points and then the path where I want to put it. And this will copy the file onto my uh, remote device. Uh, another great program is rsync. Um, it will only copy files that have not been there already, or if they are newer, it will copy them. So rsync is like a, a selective copy. It only gets what you don't already have. It also works over network if you need to. Um, let's keep over with this. Um, logs, uh, you remember that from yesterday. Uh, 
Two more commands you can try is dmessage or journal CTL. Um, those are utilities that help you get into your logs. Um, if you, for example, have a media tom server running, um, which is this DLNA thing, now I have mini DLNA. By the time I did that uh, presentation, I used MediaTomp uh, and I had a problem. Like there were files not showing up, none of them actually. So I looked at this file, var log, which is typically where your logs are, and the MediaTomp for the MediaTomp log. And the daemon would just say, hey, um, I have no right to access that folder, end. So that's why I had no files, right? And I gave it permission to do so, suddenly it worked out. Okay, um, yeah. this live demo, we will, we will skip it. Basically, it consists in going to my Pi again and then SSHing from the Pi to the router. Um, it looks exactly the same, but this time it's an actual router. So like the thing, the Wi-Fi router, it runs Linux and you can SSH into it if you have the password. And since I flashed it on my own and I put my own password in, uh, I have access to that. So check, check what my family members are doing right now at home, right? Okay, so now that you have the knowledge to do things, you also have the responsibility to do them right. That is why the first time you typed sudo, it told you with great, with great knowledge, no, with great power comes great responsibility. And that is really something that you have to respect. It's very easy to get caught. Uh, it's not easy to get rich, even though if you're a good hacker. This is not hacking. Well, okay, it's console hacking. It's not cracking. Uh, still, you see that if you administrate a system like that, you get all the power, because you're administrator, right? Root, super cow. Okay, um, ch root, uh, just a very quick thing. If some of you had trouble booting, we took a USB key and we typed a lot of commands that had something with sys run and proc in it, right? So this, what we did is change root. Um, basically, when you want to repair a Windows boot, you have to do this. Uh, it's automatic, you don't know what's going on. On Linux, it's not necessarily that magic, so basically you do it on your own and you understand what you do. So, um, on an open source system, you plug in your USB drive, you boot from it, and you say you want to rescue the system, and then you type your password, and you will actually get access to the system that is running on your computer. The cool thing is, it doesn't have to run in order to access it. What's happening is we take the disk, basically the graveyard of your died computer and turned off state, and you hook yourself into it, and you pretend like it's running. So you take the running system from a USB key that you have booted, and you substitute all the environment of it by the files that you have, and suddenly you are in your system, just as it was alive. Um, that is called a change route. And on Ubuntu, that doesn't work that way because there is no rescue system option on Ubuntu. So what we do on Ubuntu is we do it manually. We boot on a USB key. Um, we, you remember mounting from yesterday? Yes, no? More or less. Okay, mounting is when you have your USB key, which is an abstract file, and you open it up in a way that you can read the contents of that. It's like the thing that you have to do, that you have to unmount before you remove your USB key, right? Remember that? Okay, very nice. So we want to mount, um, this is um, what my system looks like because I use LVM, or yours might look like this. That you uh, mount an FSDA into something, some folder like MNT, um, and then you do these commands, which you have to know by heart, uh, and finally you change root into it, and suddenly you have your system, and you can fix your system. Typically what you want to do is sudo grub install, which installs your boot manager again, and suddenly the system magically boots again. Change root looks really complicated. It's until you have done it the first time, and then it gets so intuitive. It's, it's really basic. It's just that it's something that you have not done at all ever, probably. Um, let's not get into detail for this more. The day you will need it, you will know what to, what to search for, change root, and you will do this by copy-pasting commands, and it will work, and then you will understand. Promise. Um, cron jobs, like, you know, these tasks on Windows, uh, Windows tasks for starting up things automatically. For those who are missing it on Linux, it exists. It's called a cron job. And you can say, um, when I do a reboot, when I log in, or every five minutes, or every second Monday in the third week of the month, um, whatever. Um, it does tasks at a given time or event. 
Okay, now development. Who of you programs C or C++? Wow, a lot of people. All right, um, you might have done it on Windows. It might have been a pain. Uh, Ming Ming W is uh, crazy. Like it's it's a hassle. I hate it. So on Linux, it's much much easier, of course. Uh, first of all, you might want to use Atom, which is an editor. There are so many editors. Um, I like Atom. I've discovered it uh, by internship. So let's go to. Uh, is there meow? No. Let's create a, no a folder meow. This means delete me. I'm just here for right now. Let's say atom dot, which means start program atom in the current session. So atom will start up. Oh, by the way, this is for uh, Arduino development. Um, if you ever need to develop on Arduino, I can recommend atom. It's really cool. Plugin is called uh, Platform IO. So I want to create a new file in this. Oh no, let's do it there. Touch uh, test.c. And it shows up magically. So what you want to include is, OK, I'm a bit rusty with my C. Uh, let's skip the arguments. We don't need them. This is what a typical C program looks like. Larger. And I think that's it. So um, remember on Windows how much of a hassle it is to to get that to run now, to compile it. So the thing is, okay, let me, I will make this large too. Maybe that helps you. Um, so there's a program called GCC. It's a GNU C compiler. And you can say, I want to have uh, this test.c. And I want to compile it to program. And that's it. And now suddenly, oh, I have to give myself the right to execute program, of course. Um, let's see, I already have the right to execute the program. Uh, so I don't need chmod like we did yesterday. So I can say dot slash program. And it says, hello room. Oh, of course, I want to backslash n there. OK. Oh, that went fast. Right. So C developers will see how fast it just went. It's just cool. I can also debug with uh, with uh, GDB, the GNU debugger, GDB uh, program, and I can say the breakpoint at main. I can say run, and you see that I can see directly what is running on my process. Um, if you don't comp if you don't study computer science, you really don't have to understand this. This is Chinese to you, but if you do, here is the assembly instruction the actual assembly instruction, right, uh, that is being shown, um, moving some value into some register. Um, also, I think somewhere there is like Hello World, <laughs> later, much later on, you can see all the registers that you have, and you can see uh, the stack that is currently running, and you will get the output there. So it's, yes, there is. Yes, there is a special configuration. Of course, so when I do advertisement for GDB, I don't go with standard GDB because it's, it's unusable. There is a, uh, oh, shoot, I forgot the name of the plugin. What's it called? Um, I believe this one is called, uh, um, um, it's, um, it's the dashboard of, of GDB or GDB dash dashboard. Uh, yeah, that might uh, be. It's, it's a config file, basically, only, which you copy into your home directory, and that's it. Yes, that is that is it. Thank you. So it's called uh, GDB dashboard, and GDB when you Google dash dashboard, uh, dash dashboard. Uh, oh, okay, yes, uh, dash dashboard. Yeah. So this is what it's called. When you Google for it, you will find this. Uh, it's on GitHub, and this is just a file. It will say you how to do it. Uh, it's a file. You copy it into your, uh, I think it's your home folder, and it's called GDB in it, and then your GDB will look much more useful. Again, this is uh, try help. Okay, um, control D, disconnect. Just uh, yeah. If you have compiler design, you will hopefully love me one day for showing you that. Um, I discovered it too late. Um, so, oh, of course, if you have a library, C++, any anybody having tried to install Eigen Library on Windows in, uh, or on Mac, when, back when you were uh, numerics course. Numerical methods for CSC. 
right? Um, if you have software doing that, or you might want to suffer one day, on Linux, all you type is you use your package manager, sudo apt-get install eigen3 lib, and that's it. Uh, package manager handles your libraries, so that's really cool. Um, again, this is under advanced, uh, or let's say the more expert topics, so unless you study computer science, you don't have to understand, sorry. Um, now, encryption is something that everybody likes, right? Especially now in the post-Snowden era, where we know that everybody wants to spy on us, that everybody is evil, so we want to hide our data. Um, my computer is full disk encrypted. It is NSA standard, as uh, some people say, from the encryption standard. That means if I lose my password, no one will ever be able to get my data out of my laptop. Why do I do that? Because I have something to hide? No, just because I can. First of all, it's free. Second, it took me about... Once I knew how it worked, three more minutes to set it up, and that's it. Once you install your system, you say uh, to, you want to encrypt it. Um, these are the commands. Uh, look them up online. It's not relevant for this course. Another thing is you can encrypt a single folder. Um, so you don't need to create uh, encrypted zip files. If you want to put your sensitive data in there, there's ENCFS. Uh, if you're interested, write the name down. So pretty straightforward. The only thing you have to know is that it doesn't like relative paths, so you have to do absolute paths. Either start with a tilde, uh, which means home folder again, or start with a slash. Um, yes? Um, one minor thing. Um... <laughs> didn't save me it actually maybe I should. Um, um, so regarding then um, with with the erasing of of the disk if it's um, now an SSD disk command will will not necessarily have then delete all your files uh, because of, of a setup uh, that that's called where leveling uh, and certain blocks aren't uh, leveled in uh, so the thing you should be doing is a secure erase it, it's a command which you can look up uh, and it goes much quicker. It's a two-minute uh, thing then. Um, let me repeat that for the camera. Um, uh, he said that once, if you want to set up a full disk encrypted system, of course you have to wipe your hard drive first because it doesn't make much sense to not delete your data if you want to put the same data in an encrypted state again on it because then you have it encrypted and decrypted. Um, so you want to wipe your, your drive. Now with HDDs, you just write with DD zeros on it. You copy from def zero, which will put zeros on it. On an SSD, he says it's not enough to do that. Um, you need to do something called a secure erase. Uh, opposite to writing everything with zeros, secure erase will complete on modern SSDs in just a matter of seconds, because all SSDs encrypt everything you write on them. And they have a key, an internal key. Secure erase will delete the key, and everything becomes gibberish. Um, so thanks. So in three courses, you have learned the basics of a system that runs on your phone, that runs in your router, um, that runs on your laptop, on your Raspberry Pi, whatever you want. And that is really, really fast. Three courses is six hours. And you have seen all the basics you need. And today, some inspirations of what you can do. All you need to do is go out, read the man pages, Google. And you're on your own. I mean, you can now fly away. You have your wings. Um, the thing is, if you think you don't fly that well and you probably need a compass or something, there's us. So we are a great community. Uh, we're, most of us are now friends, um, and you can become friends with us too. Um, or you can just jump in to uh, drink beer with us. Uh, we have Stammtische, which are just gatherings. You can, we get together, we can talk about your problems, you can talk about the world, you can talk about Trump and whatever you want. And there will be beer. First beer is on us. Um, the other thing is... You can come to us at any time uh, to get help. You can write us emails, or you can become a member of us. The thing is, once you are a member of us, you will get a lot of contact with Linux. Because this guy will just come and say, hey, I tried this and that, and it didn't work. And then I found that program. So first you find out what the heck is he talking about, then what's the problem he's trying to solve, and then how did he solve it. And once you have done that, uh, 20 or more times, you will not know so much more. The first time I got into the alternative, I didn't understand anything. Today, I'm holding here courses, and I understand everything I just told you. So, um, yeah, you know, it goes fast. It's only been two and a half, three years since I've been in the old. Um, the learning curve is steep, and it's just so much more fun to learn when everybody is being in the same, 
in the same group and you just talk to people. I mean, you can ask right ahead, what did you just say? I didn't understand. And he will tell you. It's not like reading books. Of course, reading books is important, especially for security. You now know uh, where to look for Google, namely, or DuckDuckGo, or whatever you prefer, um, to get a Raspberry Pi server online. And you probably will find out very easily how to get your router to put that Raspberry Pi publicly exposed on the internet. You do not know yet what it means to have a publicly exposed Raspberry Pi on the internet. It means that if you have bad security, every single person can hack into it and read all the data you have on it. So you might want to talk to someone, read guides on how security works, um, because that is a topic that might be less fun. And I, of course, skipped it here. Read that. Just be careful a bit. And you can automatize pretty much anything you want. Um, your system, your Linux, is already configured to be quite secure, so you shouldn't be worrying too much. Um, by the way, we just had a very brand new member. She became a member yesterday, two days ago. And she became a member because she came to us and she was like, oh no, I tried something and I just screwed up my laptop. It won't boot anymore. So we made it boot again and then we told her, do you want to become a member? Because what she did is screwing up her laptop on her own. That's it's pretty good. For when, you, when you start with Linux, you have no clue what you do. And screwing up your system, that's, that's not as easy as it sounds. So <coughs> that means that she's interested enough, and she's also skilled enough to try out things on her own. First thing you're going to do is screw everything up. That's normal, because you're brand new to it. But then you try again, and you try again. First Arch Linux install I had took three days. Right, that's my distro. Three days, it did not work. It wouldn't work. Finally, I got it to boot. I destroyed it two days later. Um, nowadays, this is five years later, I install Arch Linux in 20 minutes, and it works with exactly what I need. Um, so that's pretty decent, and you can get there in just no time. You need to dare. And just work in virtual machines, have a lot of fun. Do not uh, let the risk of destroying something let limit your dreams, because you can always work in a protected environment where you can try out things, break things, and then once you know what you do, put it into practice for your production machine. Um, of course, the Arch Linux wiki, considered one of the best, that's where you get help. Ubuntu uses DE if you talk German and you, uh, you, you put use it, it's pretty cool. Read the man pages, RTFM. Um, Stack Overflow, one of the best resources available, and us, as I just said. Coming up, Linux Q&A session. Now, many of you probably have many questions, so we have a special Stammtisch-like session, which is specially dedicated for your questions. It's tomorrow um, at 17.15, just uh, like today, at the Lichthof of the University Building. Beautiful, by the way. Come check in, bring your laptop, bring whatever you want, all your problems, all your questions. We're going to help you out. There's going to be lots of us there. Um, now, if you want to learn Bash, which is de facto the standard scripting uh, language that you have on Linux, check out our Bash workshop. Aline will be there, and she will do a great job getting you started. Pick one of them. They're going to be both of them the same content. Spotlight courses. This is for everybody. Um, it's not trying to focus on a large uh, topic, but it's a spotlight. So that means we're going to have one topic in particular which we'll discuss in depth. And there are two th these two courses, one of them about mail encryption, the other one very advanced about how to distribute free and open source software. Um, even if you have no knowledge, um, try, it, try to get in. Maybe you get away some, uh, some points, especially GPG, I think every single person in this room will, will understand. The other one is more advanced. Um, maybe you get along something. And as said, come to the Stammtisch, we have beer. So this is some more advertisement. Uh, let it read on your own. I thank you very much, and I wish you a very nice evening. See you tomorrow.